There are three things you can do to help us out. One, you can make sure you subscribe to this channel. Two, is you can leave a comment here or on Apple Podcasts. And three, if you really want to help, you can follow this link to see how you could be a supporter on Patreon. Word in your attic, a Zoom with a view. Delighted to welcome you all to another Word in Your Attic. Delighted to be joined by David Scott of the Pearl Fishers. I have to say this, David, it's 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 sunny and it's early morning here in London. It's no doubt early morning in Scotland. Is it sunny in Scotland today? It's beautiful. I, I join you from the West Coast, uh, oh, right. where, where I now uh, reside. And I mean, it's always before I moved in here, people said yeah, the weather's better here. And I kind of you know, scoffed. But actually, it is. All oh, right, and, good. And, and generally speaking, it, it's beautiful, and it's absolutely a beautiful morning. Better than where? Better than Glasgow, presumably. Yes, I, I bet certainly better. The better than when I was born and brought up, my my beloved hometown of Falkirk, which which you know this is yeah. like Costa del Glasgow. You know? <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> I, I tell you why. I tell you why I mentioned early morning because I I I keep the pearl fishers records on my desk do you know why i keep them on my desk i don't put them away i keep them on my desk because i so often play them first thing in the morning there's something about particularly first thing on a sunny morning <laughs> like today oh that's great uh yeah i find they they suit that time of the day and they suit that my mood at that time of the day which is you know Quite Listen, quite that's, a, that's a good thing because, because it, I suppose it speaks about something about the brightness of, of the music. And it's not, I mean, it's not always bright. There, 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 are, there are dark alleys in that music too, but, but essentially there's no stopping the kind of optimism of them. Well, good, right. well so, so, there you go. yeah. so they fit into that, that particular moment of the day. So if you haven't already tried them, try them at that time of the day. That's my advice. So, David, what you, as you know, what we traditionally do in these chats is we ask people to... Uh, Start by telling us if they can remember the record playing equipment that was in their home when they were a child. Can you go that back that far? Well, I, I, yes and no. I, I, and I've thought about this really long and hard last couple of days. Um, what, what the first piece of record playing equipment I can remember really strongly uh, was the one that was given to me when I was a kid. Uh, which and I bet I'm not the only person that's ever ever said this. It was a Fidelity UA4. Mm, okay, God. I've got, is that is that brand never come out in one? Well, no, no, I, I no, but go on, tell us. You more. Down so set like is the, little, the usual like, unit. Yeah, well, I mean, people say that, and I think it's, uh, there, there was a dance or there was a bush or one of those kind of little sort of portable things in my grandmother's house, uh, and and we used to sort of like hunt it, be hidden away from us. We could hunt that to, to, pl to play little seven inches on. But but I was given this Fidelity UA4, very kind of cheap uh, record player with little speakers. I was in a sort of white vinyl, you know, white vinyl uh -huh. kind of cover yeah. on, it, on it sort of thing. <clears throat> um, and I actually had that thing for years and years and years. And I love it. I mean, I love vinyl. I love, I still buy vinyl and and and, and really enjoy it, but I've never really been an audiophile as such. I don't buy vinyl because I think it sounds better. I mean, I, I think you find lots of people here that tell you CD sounds better, but, but I like the ceremony of it. I like how, yeah. how records feel yeah, precisely. and I just loved that thing and, and it just it had a little kind of tinny sound but that's that was kind of home. what was I mean, on it can you remember I mean is there anything that your your family were playing when you were very young you grew up you remember well, listening to well my dad uh, my dad's taste in music was was pretty sort of straight down the line and and he would be less I mean he was kind of buying ABBA records as they came out in the 70s right okay uh, and so I mean that is something that's really really stayed with me so I actually remember all of those albums coming out as they came out because he yeah. would have them on and that would be a big sort of thing. Um, but the other thing that, that that he played music on was a little cassette player, like a little, you know, right. cassette, radio cassette. And, and so a lot of the things that I probably uh, engaged with first were things that were on cassette. And actually one of the things I brought today is I brought on vinyl, but I first uh, heard it on cassette. And so it was my dad and my mum weren't, record people no they played popular music you know so so cliff richard or whatever or or or, or abba uh, and that does sort of imbue you with a certain kind of love of of sort of mainstream 
neat, melodic, yeah. nicely produced music, you know? Yeah, yeah. Were they ever, were your parents part of that generation who actually referred to uh, to the music carriers as tapes? I know my mother did this in the 70s. I noticed this. No longer talked about records. Oh, have they got a tape out? You know, they, <laughs> Let's put a tape and, on. And, yeah. and to, to somebody Absolutely. like me, that made my soul shrivel. You know, it's <laughs> not a tape, mother. It's a yeah, record. It's a record. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, I know. And it's funny how those kind of things actually matter and then they don't yes. really matter, you know. <laughs> um, it's, but, but yeah, they, they were. And uh, again, uh, it would be... The best of what's your favorite album? Oh, the best of the Beach Boys. It's a be- yeah, that's yeah. right. Best, the best of, of the Beatles. <laughs> yeah, like oh, the the best of Cliff. <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, but unfortunately, there's not been a best of Abba yet. <laughs> that will be the best. <laughs> yeah. So, what was the first thing you bought for yourself? Can you remember that? I can, and all of this collides today because you, you asked me to, 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 to look at things and, and a lot of these things can like the first thing I bought with my own money was was this okay. oh well god that's, that's quite that's a cool thing very to precocious <laughs> how it old was were you when you bought that that's really interesting 14 I think wow amazing 14 and the reason I bought it yeah. is because I read about it in a book and I was intrigued by Brian Wilson um, as I still am uh, and and somebody said, well, this is really is the one. And so actually the first Beach Boys record I heard, a lot of people say, well, you know, I love the stuff and songs or whatever, or, or, or the sort of, those kind of hit records. And then I heard Pet Sounds and it was a wee bit difficult. My first record was Pet Sounds. Yeah, so yeah. that was my kind of, you know. Uh, and that album, it, it probably, along with another couple, I mean, Ram was another one that I bought very early on. And, and, and Masterpiece. Oh, uh, it is, God. and at the time it was, it was, it was uncool to like Ram, <laughs> yeah, Ram, yeah, anything was. by Paul. But actually, I remember at the time thinking, when you put that record on on your little Fidelity UA4, a whole world of expression and and magic opens up to you. And it's the like, melody lines, oh, things like "Dear Boy," incredible, oh, beautiful country, just beautiful, yeah, beautiful. So, so a lot of that kind of thing thing came came up. But I'll and I'll talk about a little book uh, later on that gave me some clues, uh, you know, into in, into some nice bits of music. So, where were you buying records? Can you remember? Oh, I can. Go I was on. I was buying records in a shop called Bruce's. In oh well, we know oh, Bruce. Yeah, we, Bruce. we know Bruce. Yeah, yes, Bruce in Edinburgh. Flint. Which which Bruce's? The Edinburgh Bruce in Falkirk. So the Falkirk. Bruce, oh yeah. yeah, Bruce had shops all over. Yeah. I mean, I had one I think in Linlithgow and Falkirk in Edinburgh and Glasgow. Yeah. Uh, but Falkirk was was a really really cool shop uh, to go. There. I mean, it's funny now. I was saying this to my niece the other day. There, God, you know, there were five record shops in Falkirk when I was. Well, yes. I mean, beautiful. So, so were there a lot, the, of, were there a lot of students in uh, in Falkirk? Because because uh, Bruce, they traditionally opened shops where there were a lot of students. Well, there was a technical college, and I went there to do graphics in the sort of early eighties. But but it wasn't a studenty place. I mean, right, of course, okay. Falkirk. You know, if you're in Falkirk. You are 20 minutes on the train to Glasgow one mm-hmm. way, 20 minutes to Edinburgh on the train the other way. So, yeah, I suppose there were students who would be living at home. But Bruce's was an amazing shop. And I mean, he he would tell you himself, uh, and I know him very well to this day, he, he would tell you he only employed vinyl junkies. OK, yeah. so you couldn't actually get a, a job in that shop if you didn't know who, you know, family were. Or, I'm you not know. Sure. And, and in a sense, that meant you could go in and have a meaningful sort of conversation with people. I remember at the time there was all this chat in the in the NME about Scott Walker. Uh, you know, what's happened to Scott Walker? You know, these amazing records that he made, you can't get them anymore. And I would go in and say, have you got any Scott Walker? And they would, they would look at you and get, okay, you're okay. You know who Scott Walker is. <laughs> <laughs> you know? You'd get treated a, a, a bit better, you know. So were you the kind of person who just hung about record shops? Yes. <laughs> Just any, I, any spare moment, just go in there. Any spare, so my Saturday was really just to walk into, into Falkirk and do a tour of the record shops, lingering right. longest in Bruce's. Uh, but I mean, even had, they had, you know, they had actually quite substantial record departments in Boots and yeah, John yeah. Menzies, you know. Yeah. Uh, what kind of things were you buying then? So it was, I suppose for me, it was... I was discovering the Beatles at that point and 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 buying up everything I could. And then later on, I tell you what, one thing that, that was a real kind of thing for me, I went to see Joni Mitchell in 1982 at the Playhouse in Edinburgh. Uh, and, and it was fantastic. And she played this song, which I later 
that uh, you know found out was Amelia. You know that song, right? Oh right, yes. yeah. Uh, and I was so transfixed by it, but she didn't say what it was, <laughs> and, and and I couldn't actually hear. It. I think is she saying a million or is it? All oh, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Couldn't work it out, and I actually bought, went through every Joni Mitchell, bought every Joni Mitchell album. And of course, the last one I bought was Hira that had a million. Oh, which had it. Finally, yes. <laughs> so because that cost it, you a lot. It, now then, you could have googled it. <laughs> or, or yeah, played it, played it online. I, I, I suppose yeah. the point I'm making is that, quite, I suppose when you're in your kind of mid to late teens, what you're doing is you're trying to hoover up and and understand all of the, the that little corner of something that is actually intriguing you. So I would be hoovering up all of the Beatles, all of the solo stuff. Um, all of that, but but you know, also, I suppose uh, artists that were a little bit more off the beaten track, you know, well at the time for 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 kids of my age, like Burt Bacharach, for example. Right, oh, right. right. Yeah. So I'm going to say, so this is eighty two. You weren't particularly following what was in the charts and so forth. No, I, I was. I just wasn't that. I just probably was. I don't know. I just wasn't kind of really knocked out by it. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. It, and I think, you know, now I think I, I listen back and there's lots of music that was getting made kind of early 80s to, to mid 80s. And because I was making records by 1984, 85. Right. Uh, and, you know, you're influenced by what was happening at the time and you love some of the music, but you're you're still probably trying to get over. And I know it's easy to criticise because you've got to move on, you've got to listen to new music and all that. But, you know, when you've been hit by the Beatles... You know, and and you've and you've heard Brian Wilson's Beach Boys Love You. You know, you're, you're actually trying to get over the majesty of that huge amount of work. There's a sort and of that pattern, certainly was my experience. There's a kind of pattern emerging here because it's Burt Bacharach and it's and it's Pet Sounds and it's the uh, the Beatles and it's kind of and Scott Walker. So it's kind of symphonic pop, pop with arrangements and strings. Was obviously something that even at that age kind of yeah. connected with. Is that right? Yeah, def- definitely. Well, what was that then? I, I, I think, I'll tell you, one, one of the things, would it, would, would it be a, an appropriate moment to bring, to show you Pretty, where my... Any, my any, go on, do, so, do, do. And, and, and this, I, I, I show this... Right, oh, right. Okay. So, oh, look. yeah, I know. It's got um, raindrops keep falling on my head on it, isn't it? Oh, check, check, check the inner sleeve of that. Yeah. <laughs> Good looking boy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that is actually a compilation album uh, of, you know, taken from various... Uh, of Burt's own kind of versions of his own songs. And if anybody's heard those kind of versions, they'll know that they're quite eccentric. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So you get a version of Raindrops Keep Falling on That's My Head right. and they only, they only kind of sing half of it. You know, they do Alfie and they get the whole instrumental yeah, and yeah. you just get one little bit of lyric. And the, the, the melody lines are kind of either voiced by strings or maybe a piccolo or something or even guitar. And then, you know, the singers come in. The point I'm making is that sort of for me in music, I think we spend a lot of time trying to understand the impact of music through lyrics, you know, or these amazing complex lyrics. For me, the thing that really kind of rammed home very early was what melody can do and what the contrasting sounds. And they really came on on that album for me. And I remember thinking, I probably, you know, as an 18-year-old guy, shouldn't be really loving this record. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you, know, you know, it's it's just not a hip record, you know, but it just is something I've kept coming back to. And I think it's because of that, the impact that came from the tunes and the, as you say, Mark, that, that kind of, yeah, that sort of symphonic depth and width yeah. speaks about the human experience for me. And it's just, it just resonates, still does. I, I first remember seeing Burt Bacharach. When he used to pop up, whenever Marlene Dietrich did Sunday Night at the London right. Palladium, he was her musical director, wasn't he? he yeah, was, he was. Wasn't he? Yeah, yeah, he was. He was the uh, handsome young chap at the piano that she always used yeah. to make a little thing of, you know. But there's a great photograph, actually, of, of them arriving at Edinburgh Airport, or Turnhouse Airport, as, as it was called in the day. And, and the, the pair of them just look, like, impossibly... Like, <laughs> Edinburgh Airport! Exotic uh, creatures. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you ever seen those wonderful pictures which you, you can find online of... 1971, I think, it, it definitely is. When the Rolling Stones toured Britain, and they, uh, you, there's Mick and Bianca turning up at, at Newcastle Station. They've come by train. <laughs> 
and they really look as if they come from Mars. It's absolutely extraordinary because because behind them is a background that could be 1955. That's right. I've seen and that, that picture. And they it's just appear. amazing hats and stuff, is it? It's really yeah, absolutely yeah, extraordinary. Yeah. So well, you were studying. You you were, did music at school and so forth. Yeah. No, you know, not not really. Uh, I I crashed. I crashed a music in fifth or sixth year I, I i i was doing music but in our school you couldn't you, you couldn't do music and art and i wanted to be a, a a visual artist so so that's that's what i did but i tell you what that made a, as big an impact on me as studying music you know? right right so could, you could read music though and so forth did you no, play an instrument i could i could so i won a i won a competition when i was in primary seven at school uh, they did this thing, that, you know, you, you got a, a prize, a free music lessons for a year, but they tested your aptitude. So, so I, I came top of the, the, the school and I got free trumpet lessons for a year and I carried on playing it. So I could read, I could read and I, I suppose learn to read, but it was much later uh, when I was trying to write strings for Pearl Fisher's records that I thought, God, I better learn how to do this. I oh, right, so, so you yeah, learned yeah, relatively yeah. late. I did. I, I, and actually, funny enough, I, if I'd, if I'd, if it had been three or four years later, I wouldn't need to bother because you could just play it and logically yeah. print out the music for you. But, yeah. but I did, and that was a good that again, that was a good experience. That was a really good taxing experience to learn. So sorry, did you just say the logic will print out the if you play yeah. something, it'll print out for you the sheet. Yeah. Music. So now what I do, if, I if centuries of experience, I didn't know that. The <laughs> I know. So you if don't I even do... have to write out the notes and the staves and none of that. No, and I miss you it. Change but... key with just a touch of a button. You can. And, yeah. and actually, the other thing is because some mus musical instruments, like a viola, you have to write it slightly differently. So you just kind of type in viola, and it changes it all for you. Oh, God, God no. But the thing is. You still have to write good parts, okay? No, sure. so, yeah. so you know, so if you write if you write a whole load of garbage, that's what's going to come out, you know. Right, right. Yeah. So, what was your first experience performing then? Uh, you know, on stage and so forth. Probably, probably in school, but then more professionally, I think that I got my the first thing that I did, and again, this this I brought this. Thought you no, see. Go on. Have you seen one of these? Oh, oh, oh no, the Fosdex, is it? No. It's, a, it's actually a Tascam. A Tascam. It's a Tascam. It's, it's and it's, I brought that set. because, yeah, yeah. One, one of the things you, you were asking about was, and I will get back on your question in right, a right. second, but, but this, this, this is, is kind of relevant. Um, the, there was a program called Tomorrow's World. Do you remember that program? Oh, yeah. Right? Michael Rod came yeah, on. Yeah. One, you remember him? So oh, he came yeah. on one week and he said, we've got this, this amazing new thing where you can have a whole recording studio in this little box. Okay, did you, did you see that when it went out? And, and he, he said, it's called a Porta Studio. And he said, I'm now going to uh, demonstrate it for you. And he recorded a wee drum machine line and he played the bass and he set the guitar and then he sang a lead vocal. You can actually find it on YouTube. Um, and, and I remember thinking at the time, my God, this yeah. is this is what incredible. I need. So I scraped, scraped, scraped and scraped and I, and I bought one. And the first thing I did was to make an album and think, well, what do you do if, if you can record multi-track? You better make an album. So I made an album, pressed up in cassette, sold it around Falkirk to all my pals. Uh, and eventually somebody kind of noticed this, a guy called Bobby Henry, uh, who was a... Oh, a, yeah, I remember. Yeah. yeah, Bob, beautiful guy. Yeah. And put me out on this, on this compilation album. Anyway, I'll get into the point. Uh, they said, well, look, it's this little label called Shift. We're going to go on a UK tour, a package tour. Come along and, and audition for it. So I turned up at the audition in Cumbernauld Town Hall without having actually formed a band. <laughs> so I, I just kind of found two or three people that were there. I said, do you want to come? We'll just jam. It'll be fine. So we got on stage and I, we kind of did this absolute chaos. And they said, Davey... <laughs> You, you know, we think you probably need to actually form the band first. Right, right. <laughs> I mean, so that was my first experience. What was good about it, though, was it, I really had to think, OK, so how did I do this? And I started performing more as a kind of solo artist and, and, and did various little kind of bits and pieces. And that was really the thing that allowed me to kind of find... I remember doing a thing, uh, Castle Milk for Africa. It was in the, it was in the, the, the wake of... Uh, live aid and all of that kind of stuff and doing something standing up there on my own with a guitar and actually being able to hold an audience 
and have uh, a conversation mm. with him. And that 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 was a good moment. So yeah. Where did you learn any of that kind of stagecraft? Because what do you remember the first groups you saw? In fact, uh, actually, not really. I, I didn't see. It. That's one thing about folk growing up in Falkirk. The, you didn't actually see. Nobody playing actually, it. Actually, yeah. probably one of the, the the first things I saw. There were a couple of things. We we had a, a school magazine, and we went. The, this was in the days of new wave of British heavy metal. All right. <laughs> and we went through to Tiffany's, <laughs> Tiffany's in Edinburgh, and we interviewed and saw t- two bands. One was Budgie, right? Hey! Yeah. <laughs> Berg Shelley crops up on these all the time. <laughs> you know, does he? He's well, a great funny. folk hero to us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, we, we had a great interview, but it was an interview with the bass player. And it was only years later. I mean, the, so the bass player sat down with us for an hour and a half. And I thought, God, that was really great. Was <laughs> so the thrill got a bit He couldn't <laughs> shut him up. I know. And then finally, the other, the other yeah, exactly. The other group that we that we uh, interviewed and saw there was Girls School, right? right oh, right, yeah. Right, right. And, uh, and I, I mean, this is this is so unbelievably callow. So I would bear in mind I was only in fifth or fifth year at school or something. And I, and I said this, I thought this was a great question. I says, do you take drugs? <laughs> and she says, why? You got any? Yeah. <laughs> you take drugs? I know. It's mm, I've so, never thought of asking anybody that question <laughs> ever. That's I mean, a brilliant I mean, idea, that Unbelievable. Is. So those were the kind of things. And then it was, and then it was Jody. You should just reconstruct the rock interview. It's like three <laughs> questions. It's really simple. Yeah. Do you have lots of sex? Have yeah. you made lots of money? Do you take drugs? Do you take drugs? It's interview yeah. over. Yeah. Don't need to hear <laughs> the music, thanks. That's all the people want to know about. Oh, like. God. Oh, so unbelievable. But anyway, so, so, the, so yeah, in a way, probably stagecraft is something that, yeah, it's a good question because I realise a lot of musicians are far more absorbed in the business of music and going to see music by the time than I was. I sort of learned kind of doing it. Yeah, well, you were obviously, yeah, you were at home, literally in the bedroom, weren't you, with the Tascam? Yeah. Putting on little tiny, uh, you know, <laughs> high vocal parts and things. Yeah, yeah, know. absolutely. Yeah, so yeah. What, what else have you got out there to show us? Well, I brought this. I actually got two copies of it. This, this is, this, you know, this book. Oh, right, yes, yes. Derek Taylor, yeah. yeah. I mean, you read it recently, it's on, wonderful. Yeah. It is, and the reason I brought it up is, is partly, you know, we, we're speaking about the, the, the Beatles. I would say that this is close to my favourite book of all time. Really? Uh, what, the Derek it, Taylor? Yeah, I mean, I really, I really, really love it. Oh, the scene uh, where they go to the little village when they're all taking acid. So, Paul so plays that, Hey Jude on the piano. Oh. Yeah, I, I wrote that down there right now. I mean, I think it's one of the things, and it, again, I'm going to get back to music in this book, because I think there is a music thing about Derek Taylor as well. But the, I mean, it's almost like a Robert Altman film. This thing, you know, this the, it's these tiny little scenes, all of which start to kind of um, uh, cohere. But it's that central scene that the the with, with they go to record the Black Dyke Mills band, yes, yes. And, and end up in in the village of Harold, as you say, like Harold. And there's a beautiful uh, line at the end of it. I, I just read it this morning. It's, it's so, so, it's so good. It's one of my two copies. Uh, oh, very good. Uh, where he's where he's sitting. Derek is sitting outside, and 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 he's just overwhelmed by the moment of it. And somebody comes out and says, uh, uh, "Alan Smith came out, pissed us on you, and said, why so sad, old friend? Why so sad on such a night? Not sad, I said. Not sad." Just happy to be alive, yeah, and that, lovely. in a sense, is is the music of, of, of the of this book. And I mean, one of the, one of the things I think, as a, as a writer, you, you guys know this better than I do. Writing prose is, is 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 has its own poetry and has its own rhythm and all that. So so for me, as a writer, if I'm when I'm writing scripts, for example, for my BBC podcast that I do. Uh, that he, his voice is never very far from my head because of the way that he can. It even occurred to me that that uh, some of the the Beatles lyrical ticks are not too far away from the way that he writes. You know, I give her all my love. That's all I do. And if you saw my love, you'd love her too. And I love her. It could yeah. almost be mm. like a little chapter from from. You know, it's got that kind of sing songy rhythm. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah. 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 It's, it's a beautiful thing. Yeah, you find that. And yeah, when he, there's press releases, he used to write about the Beach Boys and the Birds and people like that. It was a mm. voice that nobody had heard that before, really. And it was, uh-huh. it kind of came from a formal Daily Express background, really, but it taken a lot of drugs. 
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but also lots of literary erudition, wasn't there? You know, it really uh, stood out in a world full of press releases when he wrote something. It was extraordinary. Yeah. I mean, yeah. That- David and I sweet. met his son the other day. We very did. Excited. We were very excited. At a, we a did. We, <laughs> we went <laughs> to do it. People said, oh, this is, I can't remember. What was his name? I can't remember. Tim. 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 Was it Tim? Tim the elder, he was the eldest. So he yeah. says, yes, he's, his father was Derek Taylor. And we immediately stopped talking to absolutely everybody else in the room. <laughs> we turned around and what you know and everyone was a bit uh, a bit put out of it weren't they we, we, we were just flabbergasted just, nobody we didn't know what to say to, to them, them apart from how fantastic <laughs> yes. yeah is, isn't it amazing that that somebody like that i mean lawrence juber the guy who played in uh, in wings uh, uses this great phrase which is beatles adjacent uh, right. and, and i think one of the things you realize is not just how great they were but how many great people were in the oh, everybody they were involved with was exceptional quite extraordinary Absolutely you know. incredible uh, that's and true. That's, that's that's Al evans you know all yeah. of them just particularly extraordinary weren't they yeah, and there's, an, there's another one of these, which is 50 Years Adrift, and it came out, I think, in the late 70s, and it was a very limited edition. Um, and, and copies now go for things like two grand and all that, so somebody needs to put out 50 Years Adrift. Apparently, it's a, a beautiful thing. Oh, mm. really? That's extraordinary. Yeah. So, so uh, tell, me about, tell me about the Pearl Fishers and how that came, came to be. Uh, the, so... My kind of career has been a bit back to front. So I, I started off with a couple of big sort of major record deals that, that really went nowhere. I had a, a deal with Phonogram in the mid-80s and then was signed by CBS uh, in the sort of mid to late 80s. I only managed one single on both of those deals. Wasn't and this the time that Paddy McAloon was signing to CBS? Paddy McAloon. Paddy McAloon. Yeah, I remember you were, you, you know, I know you're a huge admirer of his. I think he was there at the same time, wasn't he? He was there at the same time. In fact, I remember. Did you well meet him then? Remember. I've never met Paddy, but I, I will I'll tell you one thing. I was uh, next door. I was at my my ANR was Annie Rosebury and 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 he was uh, being ANR by Muff Winwood at the time. They had offices next door to each other, and I was there seeing Annie when Paddy was in playing Muff Hey Manhattan and Nightingales, and a bit of a, an argument erupted next door, <laughs> which which I thought was you know they're either arguing about the quality of this music or whatever. But I've got to say. And you're sitting there and you're listening to Nightingales and Hey Manhattan. I was thinking, oh God, I, think I might as well give up. <laughs> I might as well give up. I know. So, so, and I mean, really, I mean, it's, be- it's beautiful stuff. But anyway, so that all of that kind of went away. And actually, the next thing I did was just to, to form a, a record label myself and put out two of these singles, which did quite well. Uh, and then an album called Zaza's Garden that was put out on a Scottish independent label. And then by 1996, seven, uh, I got picked up by this German label called Marina, and they've really been my kind of home ever since. And, and I think there was a, there's been a marriage of, of aesthetic, and uh, I just think we just love the same things. They package things beautifully. Uh, they kind of understand why the music's important and it's allowed me to kind of make music and and uh, potentially, you know, you, you've got a major label, you've got that that opportunity even these days to kind of reach, you know, many hundreds of thousands of millions of people. You know, if, you, if, you're, if you're making music in a more independent scenario, that's maybe a bit more difficult. But the quid pro quo to that for me is I've been able to make records the way I want to make them. No. And, 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 and... Yeah, and, and feel that there's a, a sort of body of work now that I can I feel satisfied with. Yeah. But also, you, you it's not the only thing you do, is it? You lecture no, no. and broadcast and so forth. So it's a yeah. You have a, you have a portfolio. Is that fair to I, say? I am. Yeah, and I make I make programs about, about Scottish music for BBC Scotland up here, and and yeah, I look after the arts and media, creative industries at UWS, and and yeah, I've, it's a yeah portfolio is 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 the word. And that energy, I think, is is important to me to be able to do that. It's one of the things you, you guys have, have come across so many musicians who have not quite managed to get over the fence. You know, I've maybe got great songs or whatever, but something's not quite quite right there. I've been able, because I've got a couple of different things I can do to make all of it work and sort of kind of keep pushing. So, so you're yeah, not, you're, you're, you teach you're, songwriting. You're not you're not bitter, are you? Yeah. I think that's fair no, to say. No, not not at all. Because because quite a lot of musicians you meet 
Ah, oh, there's there's a bit on it's about. I know. You know. I brought I brought this other thing to let you go see. on. You know this book. Oh, the Rock yeah. Climber. Is it now? Is that was that edited by John Collis? It was indeed. It was. <laughs> John um, Collis from Time Out. Time out. Yeah, I've sure got a copy well, of that. Yeah, this, this was given to me uh, by my dad, in 1980, when it came out. Right, and it's it's I, I bring it up for a, for a, a reason. Apparently, it's, it's a great book, and it's one of the first books that really attempted, I think, to make a canon out of uh, Western popular. Uh, right, music. yeah, yeah. Um, and there's lots of it's funny. In 1980, you, you, I, I was looking at this last night. There's some things that you think they probably wouldn't have done now. So you've got, for example, in the section on British Beat, there are there's an album by The Searchers. Uh, there's two albums by The Rolling Stones. Uh, there's an album by uh, John Mayall with Eric Clapton and only one album by The Beatles. Would right. that be the case now? No, it wouldn't. What do you think? No, Do it. No, Things have changed, no. haven't they? Anyway, the reason I, I bring this up is because one of the, the, the writers who wrote introductions and, and, and chapters to these was a guy called Dave Lang, oh, who, yeah. who yeah. then became known uh, for Three Chord Wonders, you know? Yeah. Uh, but Dave Lang, when we when we decided that we were going to do a master's degree in songwriting at University of the West of Scotland, Dave Lang was the external uh, validator. I was so when that that was a moment, and it's again one of the reasons why I say you, you know when you have these kind of slightly kind of wide ranging careers, people sort of keep colliding and right. worlds collide. Yeah. So that was quite that was a good moment, you know. And I would say that that is a book that still ha, 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 you know stands up. You can pick up copies for things like fifty pence. Oh sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, sure. So, so tell us about the yeah. the master's course in songwriting. How does that work? Uh, so we've got we we've actually got now uh, in our place we've got master's degrees right across creative industries so filmmaking uh, music industries sound production all that um, so I think what what we're not trying to do David is, is, is to say come in here and we'll teach you how to write hits no, no. because we, if we knew that we'd be doing that. yes you yeah. would not yeah. be at university no. yeah <laughs> but 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 what it does is it provides a space for people to come in. And just to think about the way they work slightly differently for, for, for a year, year and a half or whatever. And many of, of people who've come and done the, the, the Masters in Songwriting have been uh, people who are mid-career, who are, you know, making records, scoring tours and stuff, and just think, you know what, as well as getting an MA, which is a, a lovely thing to have, I'm actually going to spend maybe a year and just think about what I'm doing slightly differently, make a kind, the kind of record that I wouldn't make if I was just making another record. And, and we try and just kind of give that space. Uh, a lot of the stuff we do is collaborative. So, so the first week that they come in is co-writing. So a full week of all day co-writing and critique and all that. It didn't, it didn't exist, you know, in 1979, 1980, when I was, you know, thinking about going to art school or, or, or whatever, because music or popular music wasn't considered important enough to be, you know, studied within the academy. It is now, so we try and create that space. That's that. That's so, do you go away? Do you, do you tend to go away and listen to certain songwriters, or go and listen to you know Wally Stott's arrangements? Oh on, God, you uh, did. Well, funny you mentioned, or whatever. Or, <laughs> you mentioned you mentioned Wally. Stott. Oh right, oh, right. there was, was another that? one that I brought. Right. On. By the Escape in the Sky. Oh, that's the the Julian Cope compilation, nineteen nineteen eighty one, wasn't it? Yeah, that's a yeah. fantastic. That record really had a significant effect on his on his uh, his standing. It did, and it's still for my money the best compilation, the best Scott compilation, uh, and it's got the best colour of green. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Any record. <laughs> yeah, uh, but but the, I mean, but to answer your question, uh, Mark, yeah, I think so, and and I think what what we try not to do is to say, listen to, you know, these 10 records from the 60s, which is my instinct, okay? Yeah, right. But to just keep listening and, and to try and pull things out of what, what is happening now and, and use use those as exemplars. But we also, our students tell us, you know, what, what, what is important? What is the music that you're listening to now that is making an impact on you and why? And that's one of the big questions that you ask. Don't just tell us how much you love a song. Tell us why and tell us what, what is yeah. making that happen. What do you think of the um, – the? It, it seems to me if you look at the songwriting credits on a, on a chart hit nowadays, there'll probably be eight people. <laughs> yeah. Hi-hat programmed by – <laughs> 
<laughs> it's it's a different thing, isn't it? They're not talking about writing a song. They're talking about writing a record. They're talking about making a record, really, aren't they? It, it, it is that's true. And actually, I've got a funny relationship with that in, in one sense. I mean, I think there's a there's a uh, you, you know again not to bring everyone back to the fabs, but but if you you know McCartney himself will say, oh, you know, and I love her would would have been nothing without. Ding, 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 ding. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Right. So why do you not get credit then? Because, no, because quite... you know, because I, actually that that is that is a that's a big part of the song so i i understand if you're in a collaboration and you come up with some some little rhythmic thing that's unexpected sometimes that is the thing that catches people's ears and and you know we we probably privilege uh, you know melody harmony and lyric well we definitely privilege melody harmony and lyric over all of those kind of other things and i think probably rightly so uh because they're the things that can most clearly carry a song stripped of all of the production but if the record is a hit and there are these little kind of things that make a difference i think but, the you know, job boys operate like that i think neil tennant writes the lyrics and i think he writes most of the chord sequences and, and, and melodies and chris is obviously programs and plays things but he also writes those kind of little tiny figures that yeah. come in dee, 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 i'm dee, sure he's right and absolutely. that's the thing that everybody remembers funny well, yeah yeah absolutely that's what makes you remember it and come back to it I mean, the, game, the, the cl- classic case of all this we keep going coming back to is walk on the wild side oh, lou yeah. reed got the got the huge payday really <laughs> what about you know about herbie flowers what about the girls you know what about Ken, in the end the herbie flowers did get the big payday but it took him a well i don't time. know i don't think i don't think he, he did something didn't he i don't yeah. don't i you know yeah. lou reed made millions out of that you know yeah. so, i suppose that one of the one of the things is for for there was a there was a world there was a music world where a, 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 pro, a probably a lower level of touring would be would allow people to have sustainable careers uh, because you know they were maybe selling more records and whatever you whatever little record royalty you got would amount to more than it does today. I'd listen. I, I don't pretend to know the the economics of it, but I think probably one of the drivers of lots of people getting credits. On on songs now is something to do with the economics of it, and and oh, sure. what yeah, you need to do to be able to sustain a career in music. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what's what's coming up next for you? What's your uh, what's the next thing happening well, we've with got, pearl fishers and so forth? We have got, and I'm not sure we should make sure that you have them. If you don't, the, Marina have just reissued uh, the Young Picnickers across the Milky Way and up with the Larks on vinyl for the first right, time. Right, right. Uh, and they're beautifully done, double vinyls uh, with us with one side of extra tracks. Um, those have. So that, yeah, I think it's been reviewed quite well, so I'm excited to see that. And then I'm just finishing a new record, so I'm working. Actually, this this is my little workroom, right. uh, my attic, but um, I do vocals in here and, and and bits and pieces. So I'm hoping to have that finished by ooh, end of this year. Right, yeah. right. So there's plenty going on. So the way we we usually finish these things is asking people to tell us. What is the greatest record ever made? <laughs> and I feel that we've been searching in vain. We we need uh, education, uh, yeah, you know. But we, we thought David Scott was still at the end. Loss. <laughs> well, I tell you what, I, the, I'm going to slightly throw a curveball here. I think I've already told you what I think is the greatest record of all time, which is Pet Sounds. Right. And I think, right, Ram okay. is, I think Ram is a close uh, second. But here's one from uh, Out of Left Field. Okay. Oh, oh, okay. Entry. oh wow. Now, do you no. know what do you know what this is? Okay. No, so go this, on. I picked this up. I mean, in one of the cassettes, my dad, one of the tapes my yes. dad played was the best of Bobby Gentry. And I was always something that absolutely killed me in a great way. So I bought this record in a thrift store. Um, it's an MFP. I was going to say, it looks like, even from the front, a yeah. music for pleasure release. Yeah, it's, it's so you cheap. would have paid 99p, probably. Yeah, it's <laughs> yeah. Cheap as chips. And I looked at the, the, the songs and I didn't really know any of the songs. And I thought, oh, God, this is one of these MFP compilations where yeah. they license every kind of yeah. Yeah. B yeah. side or whatever. But I'll buy it anyway. And then when I put it on, uh, each track has these orchestral interludes. It flows as one, and this is actually a cheap reissue of an album called The Delta Suite. Oh, right. All right. And it was one of these things, I, 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 I do have copies of The Delta Suite. 
But I think the, the Delta Suite, which is her second uh, album, and sort of famously, sort of slightly tanked her career. Yes, <laughs> uh, yeah. if, if, she going to stop, didn't she? She she made, I think, she kept making records until 1971, and then singles. Oh, the right. last okay. thing she did was 78, which was a single. It fizzled out very quickly. She's just, she's just away. But the Delta Suite... Is is to me one of the great lost sixties records. It's oh well, this incredible sort of portrait of the South, uh, her own sort of backyard, and she does it so vividly, uh, and and very skillfully as well because she she's bringing together her own songs, uh, things like Morning Glory, Courtyard, Refractions, and all this, but also some pretty big ticket cover versions of things like Big Boss Man, uh, Louisiana Man, and all this, but weaves it together with this incredible sort of orchestral white screen. That's fantastic. Yeah. I've got to get this record. The hold so hold that up. Hold that up again, David. They, okay, so, that, that's the glory of uh, of EMI's this, MFP. That you this take is called, the Delta Suite and you turn it into that. Yeah, it's called <laughs> yeah. it's called way down, This is called way down south, right? When, yeah. I mean, imagine you know it's just unbelievable vandalism in some ways. But the album, the album <laughs> you want to find is called the Delta Suite, and Suite is spelled S W E E T E. Okay. Oh, right. See okay. what she did there. Yeah. yeah very good. <laughs> That's very good. That's I'm fantastic. Gonna, I'm going to look out for that. Definitely dig it out. I'll definitely do that. Thanks very much for joining us. That was terrific. Uh... Word in your attic. A Zoom with a view.